morning, afternoon and evening. I am Dennis Quack and I'll be your host today. Welcome to Imagining Educational Futures, a webinar series brought to you by the National Institute of Education, Singapore. The webinar series aims to be different, to engage with some of the most important questions in education, such as what are the purposes of education? What, how can schools facilitate social equity and mobility for all students? What kinds of reforms are needed to support teachers in the new educational landscape? How can scientific advances lead towards highly adaptive and personalized learning? How can we ensure that every child can learn to their fullest potential in their own way? The aim of the webinar series is to encourage inter, multi and transdisciplinary thinking to get thought provoking uh, dialogues going for the purposes of imagining the future of education, especially given that we are encountering futures that are increasingly extreme, unknown and even improbable. Uh, this is the second webinar of the Imagining Educational Future series, and the first one, titled The Relevance of Asian Cosmopolitanism to Education, is publicly available on YouTube, and we'll post a link in the chat. We encourage you to have a look at that when you can, as it speaks to issues that are important in this day and age, not just in Asia, but globally. Today's topic, how can science of learning influence the future of education, is also relevant for a number of reasons. For those of you who are not from Singapore, welcome. You might like to know that the Singapore government has announced late last year the next major national research thrust called the Research Innovation and Enterprise 2025 or RIE 2025 plan, which will provide close to 19 billion US dollars for research in four strategic domains. One of these domains is called human and human health potential, where the focus is on advancing human potential, especially given that human capital is Singapore's most valuable resource. Research in this area includes improving learning capacity across an individual's lifespan, and it is here that the science of learning research plays a significant role in enabling every Singaporean to fulfill his or her potential. The National Science of Learning Initiative aims to develop not only a science-based understanding of the effectiveness of Singapore's education methods, but new ways to generate better learning outcomes. In line with this, our Nanyang Technological University has just recently launched their NTU 2025 strategic plan, uh, seeking to address humanity's grand challenges, including a key one on harnessing the science, art, and technology of learning. Now, this shift in focus towards learning isn't new and can arguably be traced all the way back uh, to Singapore's major education reform thinking schools learning nation in 1997. Embracing a post fordist vision of education, this reform and those that follow continue to disrupt the notion of the factory model of public ed education to this day. Not just in Singapore, but everywhere else, we're beginning to reimagine what education can be like if we focus on the individual and the personal and on discourses of diversity and difference rather than deficit. To spearhead this endeavor, the National Education Institute of Education has almost exactly a month ago launched the Science of Learning in Education Center, or SOLAC for short, which will conduct multidisciplinary research into learning processes, and importantly, attempt to translate state-of-the-art research into the classrooms to optimize the human learning capacity for all students, particularly those with learning difficulties. Uh, for those of you who've logged in uh, early, you can, might have seen the video on SOLAC. And for our international audience, you can find more information about our research center by using our favorite internet friend, Mr. Google. As part of SOLAC's main maiden voyage, uh, this webinar seeks to uh, engage with uh, the science of learning field. We have invited luminaries and experts uh, such as John Hattie, Gigi Lok, uh, Tio Wei Ping, and Azilawati Jamaluddin to navigate us through this vast ocean of knowledge from their own unique perspectives. This will be an important and undoubtedly interesting seminar. Now, before I introduce the first speaker of the day, I would like to invite all of you to please type into the chat box where you're from and what organization and institution you work in as a way of us saying hi to each other. I understand we have quite an international audience today and I want to thank especially those of you who are up late tonight uh, for this session. I hope you have plenty of coffee, although I'm sure the speakers will help you stay up. And while you're introducing yourself, let me uh, remind you of a few housekeeping details for today's session. If you'd like to ask a question, please type your question into the Q&A box that can be found at the bottom of your Zoom panel. 
We seek your kind understanding that some questions may not be addressed during the session. Please note that this session will be recorded. And if you have any queries or face any technical issues during the course of this webinar, please reach out to us at oer.pubs at nie.edu.sg. Um, so without further ado, let's begin our journey into the science of learning. It brings me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the day, John Hattie, who requires little introduction for many of us, I'm sure. Uh, John is known to many for his two books, Visible Learning and Visible Learning for Teachers, along with numerous other publications. A researcher in education, his research interest includes performance indicators, models of measurement and evaluation of teaching and learning. The Times Educational Supplement once called him possibly the, most, the world's most influential education academic, which I'm sure many of you will agree is certainly the case. Uh, he was director of the Melbourne Education Research Institute at the University of Melbourne, Australia, and professor of education at the University of Auckland, New Zealand. He holds a PhD from the University of Toronto, Canada. And let's welcome John to share with us on the topic, COVID and the science of learning. Thank you very much, Dennis. Um, I also want to congratulate what you're doing there in Singapore and having followed and been with you over the last uh, couple of years as you set up your science of learning at all as well for a great future. Well, I want to uh, start this session today about imagining educational futures is with the mantra that I have been using uh, in my own work for a long time about trying to get teachers to see learning through the eyes of students. And you're going to hear me talk in this session about the implications of that is that maybe teachers need to release some responsibility from directing learning to the students. And the bottom line is how do we help our students to become their own teachers, which I would argue is a pretty fundamental purpose of what we do in schooling. And the big theme around that is we got some pretty fancy words for it. We call it self-regulation. But to me, it means how we help our students to become their own teachers. I'm noticing at the moment in my own life with my five-year-old granddaughter who started school and my other granddaughters that are yet to start school, they are excellent teachers between the ages of two, three, four, and five. But somehow they start to then see the person in the front of the room as the controller of what happens in their classrooms. And I want to readdress that balance. And I want to go to what I think has been the biggest disruptor in education that we have probably in the last many, many years and see it as an opportunity. Notwithstanding, absolutely, there are some sadness, there's death, there's illness, there's economic hardships. But on the other hand, it's also quite an incredibly fascinating disruptor. And I think the biggest travesty would be if we don't use what's happened over the last year or so as an opportunity to reinvent, to reconsider, and to look at what we've been doing in education and ask, is it the right way we should be moving forward? Let me start. The typical way many education systems work is top down. There is a state, a federal, a department of education that sets out edicts, sets out policies, and then they're filtered down through the principles and sometimes they hit the teachers, and sometimes they don't. But think what happened in COVID. I don't know of a single educational policy that has come into schools that has helped teachers readjust to teaching online, at distance, over Zoom, et cetera, other than whether schools should open or close. It has been a bottom-up revolution. In fact, I'll go a step further and argue it has probably been the greatest educational-led revolution that we've seen in the history of schooling as we know it. And I think we need to learn from that. Now, don't for a minute believe that every teacher across Singapore or wherever country you're in necessarily agrees with each other. But how do we harness that ability to change overnight, that ability now to see technology as just normal, the way in which social emotional learning is not seen anymore as a separate activity to what happens in the everyday lives of kids. I think we have a lot to learn from that. 
Also, over the last while, there has been some really interesting research that's starting to come out about the effects of COVID. Take, for instance, the New Zealand research based on about a million students. And what they looked at was what is the effects of last year where New Zealand had many, many months of out of class teaching compared to the last 10 years using a database that has been systematically collected. And I'm very proud to say that I, I was the developer of that ASTL database, which has now been in place almost 20 years. And you can see that the effect sizes from last year on reading are pretty smallly negative. Maths is actually similarly small and positive. The biggest negative effect from COVID was on writing. And I'm sure we can all think of explanations for that. But here's the message. Anyone who stands up and says that COVID led to massive learning loss has misunderstand the power of teachers to truly want to make a difference in a positive way to the lives of their kids. And I think the evidence is showing they did. They found ways to come up with different ways of teaching from which we have a lot to learn to make sure that the learning gains last year are not that dissimilar from any other year. I know it's a tough statement because everyone wants to look at the negative and say it was all a disaster. It was not. I go to the Netherlands and interestingly, they looked also from their eight weeks of lockdown to compare to their previous three years. And they had a major headline, 20% learning loss. Well, I challenge you to look at the bold lines there compared to the previous four years and see it. And when the arithmetic's done, it's a very tiny negative, which I'm sure many teachers can come up with a rebound to fix that. It hasn't been a dramatic loss. But as important, a study here in Australia. And I'm highlighting the positives here, acknowledging the negatives, but you look down that list in terms of teachers. We've never had more respect for teachers as we do at the moment, and we need to capitalize on that. Many parents have realized that teachers have incredible expertise. They don't just deal with their one or two precious offspring on a daily basis. They deal with 30 to 40 in a high school to 200 every day for 200 days a year. That requires incredible expertise. Also from a student's point of view, many of them were in a novel word in education because we talk about effectiveness all the time, but many of the students were more efficient. And some of them are saying things like, I can do the work so much faster when I'm at home. What do I do at school all day? But the other side of it is from the parents. Here in Australia, we had close to four months of out of school teaching. And I remember on the Monday when the students all went back to school, you could put your head out the window and hear that collective sigh of relief from many of the parents. But they have learned also about the language of learning. They've realized that it's, even though they went to school themselves and should remember this, it's not about getting it right or wrong. It's not about handing it in neatly on time. It's about a struggle. And struggle should be made the most powerful positive word that we use in this science of learning. How do we struggle with understanding? How do we struggle with so much new knowledge? How do we struggle to build coat hangers of understanding to hold on top of the massive incoming that can happen as we go about this learning equation? How can we reconcile it with our previous conceptions of learning? How can we use it to then go on and have deeper understanding and transfer? This is what happens in the daily lives of learners. And this is what many parents saw. And I think they had a much deeper and better understanding of what it means to be a student in school today than probably any of the previous ways that they've interacted with schools about their own students. But we also a massive move from a debate about teaching and curriculum, which dominates so many of our schools at the moment, to during COVID teaching, we had a much more focus on student learning and making this students their own teachers. We went from a model of lots of talking to a model of lots of triage, kind of like nurses, teachers working out what was important at the moment what the students actually knew and didn't understand, did not understand. 
Remember, kids don't come to school to learn that which they know. They come to learn that which they don't know. How do you privilege errors? How do you privilege mistakes? How do you privilege students who don't understand? And we saw that using a lot of the Zoom kind of teaching that we don't see in the regular classroom. And so when I look at what happened in COVID learning, there was that move to the triage. There was that move to seeing progress through to achievement as fundamentally much more important than achievement. The whole debate that we've had about high achievement is sometimes not helping a lot of schools and a lot of students. Those students who start above average, we have to add at least a year's growth for a year's input for those students, as we do for students that are below the average. And sometimes we're not as good with those students above the average as we think we are. All the focus gets put on the kids below the average, which is not a bad thing, don't get me wrong. But every student, no matter where do they start, needs that sense of progress. And teachers, and sorry, and parents who consider the best schools in the area, the ones that have the highest achievement, can be very misleading because they may not necessarily be adding that at least year's growth to each of those students. It was seeing and moving from the purpose of a kid in classrooms is to be right, to get things correct, to seeing failure as the learner's best friend, to seeing that struggle that I was talking about as the essence of what learning is. It's moving away from labelling students. And, oh, unfortunately, we're very, very good at labelling students, which often sets very low expectations by teachers, by parents and for students, to moving it and saying, no, every student needs learning interventions. As we've done here in my own university here in Melbourne, we abolished the special education program about five years ago. And yes, it upset a few people who argued that their particular special learning need was quite different from another one. And we brought in Lorraine Graham and said, we want you to set up a program about learning interventions for special needs kids. And one of the side effects of that is now virtually every student in our teacher education program wants to take that course because every student needs a learning intervention. And that focus on what makes a difference to the learning lives of every student. And then I go back to where I started. Moving away from teachers being the director of learner and having this gradual release of responsibility. And I hope that becomes a usual phrase that we use in our schools from now on. How do teachers release that responsibility to allow the students to become their own teachers? This notion of self-regulation. Surely, surely the ultimate success of any lesson is to ask students, can you now teach someone else? And one of the things that we did in the COVID experience is invented a new term, teach back. And it came out of all the research on uh, peer tutoring, which we know is a pretty powerful way of doing things, but sometimes it's implemented with the bright students teaching the not so bright or the older teaching the younger, and I think that misses the point. And we had the system in the school we were working with of Teach Back Tuesday. Each Tuesday, the students had to teach another student, a group of students, their parents or the teacher, what they've been learning over the last week. And you heard them thinking aloud. You heard them preparing quite differently for a presentation than when they're asked to get up and present about some report they've done. Because they had to think and understand how other people went about the process of thinking. Building that social sensitivity which our employers so want in today's world. Can this employer work in teams? Can they translate? Can they communicate? I don't know how many times I've been into schools and seeing students sitting in groups, working alone. Seeing students being told they have to work in groups, but their assessment is individual about them. And this whole build up of collective self-efficacy, which we know is very, very powerful for adults, but how we build it also amongst our students. So my message today is we've got a lot to learn about the science of learning if you take it from this perspective. Look down these mind frames. Our argument is these are the kind of things that we want our students to do, 
We want them to know their current level of understanding. And you can read the rest of that list. As I commented earlier, if you go into class of five-year-olds, you see this. If you go into class of eight-year-olds, they think their job is to come to class, to sit up straight, and to watch the teacher work. No, it's these attributes that matter. And what are these attributes? That's what we mean by self-regulation, or in the terms we've been using, assessment-capable students. This is the notion of learning that I like to see the science of learning develop, and I like to see in every classroom, so that when students go from one year to the next year, when they go from our school to another school, when they go from a school to a tertiary or to a job, they have got the skills of knowing how to teach themselves. We need to move away from the current instructional model where teachers prepare an instruction phase, some activities for the students to do, a reporting back phase and a wrap up phase, which is the traditional model, where teachers talk sometimes 70 to 80% of the time. They ask 150 to 200 questions a day, requiring less than three seconds feedback from the teacher, from the students. And this crazy debate that we have about different teaching methods is if some are right and some are wrong. The only time a teaching method is right is if it has a positive impact on a student. And many times we have to switch between explicit instruction and inquiry learning. And it's about the notion of when is the right time to do it. But if we're gonna to move to this model of self-regulation the students becoming their own teachers, we need a lot more cognitive analysis of the skills required to understand the content that is being taught. Not an easy thing to do, but I think it's the right thing that we should be focusing as a research community, helping our teachers understand the cognitive analysis of what's happening. We did a lot more discovery and never, never presume, but discover what the students actually bring to the lessons. One researcher demonstrated a few years ago that every lesson, 50% of the students know the stuff that's already being taught. That's kind of taking it a bit too far. How do we actually know what students bring to the lessons? How do we make this distinction between the content, the surface, the, the knowing that, and the deep, the conceptual, the relationships, the knowing how, and the transfer, and getting those three parts of that equation, surface to deep to transfer right, all are important. But we analyze so many classrooms, they tend to overly focus, sometimes up to 90% on the surface alone. And there's a conspiracy. Kids above average prefer teachers to work at the surface level because that's the game they're very good at. How do we see progressions and progress that kids go through as multiple ways and different times to get there and not assign kids to different groups and give them different materials, which can often set very low expectations? And that whole notion of bringing the, the joy and the thrill back into the learning, the questions of asking why. This is the argument that I want to put to you today, that we have an opportunity here through this focus on the science of learning to better understand the skills, the processes that are going on, to move away from that teacher control to teaching students how to become their own teachers. And I give you that as the way in which I would imagine the educational futures. Thank you. Thank you, John, um, for that wonderful presentation. Our next speaker is Gigi Lok, uh, who will be sharing with us on the topic, linguistic diversity in education, the need for transdisciplinary research. Gigi Lok's um, research on the cognitive and neural consequences of bilingualism extends across the lifespan. She leads a research program that examines how diverse language experiences shape development and learning. Using neuroimaging and behavioral methods, Gigi studies bilingualism as an interactional experience that shapes cognition. In addition to investigating the science of bilingualism, Gigi has examined how to harness scientific findings on bilingualism to improve the educational experiences for children from diverse learning language backgrounds. In particular, she has established a research program investigating effective ways to examine bilingualism and learning, how bilingualism and executive functions interact to influence literacy outcomes, and brain mechanisms underlying learning new information in children and adults. 
Gigi obtained her PhD in cognitive psychology from York University, Canada in 2008. She then completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Rodman Research Institute at the Baycrest Center before joining the Harvard Graduate School of Education in 2011. In 2019, she joined the Department of Educational and Counseling Psychology at McGill University, Canada. Over to you, Gigi. Thank you, Dennis. And um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, I, I think we have many uh, people from different continents here, so I would like to extend my um, greetings in all time zones. Uh, here, uh, I am 12 hours uh, behind Singapore. So for me, it's 11 28 p.m. and this is the first time I'm giving a talk this late so we'll see how that goes. Uh, thank you for this very nice introduction Dennis and um, as you know in the 21st century education becomes a um, indispensable experience for every child in this planet. Um, and I think uh, for us to start thinking about how we can collaboratively promote um, education for the next generation, we have to start thinking about transdisciplinary research. And so what is transdisciplinary research? A transdisciplinary research is actually a way that you can think of as um, an extension of previous research, such as uh, multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, or interdisciplinary. And in transdisciplinary research, not only that people are working together, because that's just one way of thinking about it, but in fact, it's actually joining effort across many diff different disciplines. And importantly, we have to include the stakeholders of a particular field, such as um, education. So in this case, you can think of it as educators, parents, students. Um, and of course, it's not easy to work with other people. A biologist would have a very hard time working with um, a humanities researchers. But at the same time, uh, this kind of opportunity will push us to be open-minded to other disciplines. And when knowledge are integrated across discipline, we create what we call hybridized knowledge. And we also share common semantics and pragmatics. So we learn each other's languages in terms of uh, the discipline and also facilitate the collaborations to achieve a common goal. So my training has been in psychology mostly, uh, but I have also been trained in doing neuroscience and now I am doing education research. So I'm going to share just one slice of how we can think about transdisciplinary research um, in my own expertise, which is bilingualism. And uh, in particular, I would like to share with you, uh, because of the 20 minute time limit, I'm just going to be able to share with you a slice of uh, uh, transdisciplinary research. And in this case, I would like to advocate for the thinking that cognitive neuroscience uh, research and education research has a lot to offer and join forces to um, enrich education practice and policy. Many people think of neuroscience research being in the lab and also not as applicable, but as you see in the opening video, there is a lot of potential that we can bring it to real life. And because um, if you think of neuroscience to education as a one-way direction, then it is, of course, very limited in a way because cognitive neuroscience research often um, examine a an artificial, in an artificial testing context, meaning that we do it in a lab, like the research that I'm about to show you using um, fMRI, uh, participants will have to lie in a scanner, supine, uh, for about 40, 45 minutes. And any single movement will actually change the quality of the data we collect. So it's nothing like sitting in a classroom learning or even interacting with your peers learning as a Professor Hattie has just uh, shared with you. And in neuroscience research, we often also looked at very specific cognitive constructs or learning constructs or social construct. And in this case, these specific construct also doesn't uh, provide a comprehensive full picture of what learning is really like. And to be fair, cognitive neuroscience research serves the goals of um, fulfilling scholarly inquiry instead of uh, changing practice or changing um, policy. And so I'm pro, um, proposing that there's a new way to think about uh, how we can bring this all together. 
And it is to uh, consider that we know substantial amount of information about neuroscience and learning, as you see some of the example in the opening video. But now what we need to do is to put this knowledge into context. And the context that we have to consider is education. In education research, um, what we would really like to do is to understand the challenges and the stakeholders who are experiencing the challenges. And most important of all, we are putting learners' welfare and uh, their well being in the forefront. So in this case, in transdisciplinary research, not only we build a partnership between neuroscience and education, but uh, the question, the fundamental scholarly inquiry will have to be inspired by educational challenges that um, children or uh, educators experience on a daily basis. And of course, because the way that we do research is uh, fairly artificial. And so we also have to be a little bit more creative and take in uh, the opportunity to create and design ecologically grounded and relevant approaches in terms of task and in terms of analysis. And this is by no means an easy feat, but there is a potential we can do it. And so in transdisciplinary research, uh, there are four things that we can consider. The first one is a team. And of course, we can only have researchers in the team because sometimes we spend a lot of time in the ivory tower and we don't really know what's going on in the outside world. And so we collaborate with educators. Not only that, but we also uh, collaborate in a way that is in the, in the, at the intellectual level, whereby uh, researchers will learn a little bit about the daily practices of educators and students. And we also want to uh, share and have teachers to come in and uh, help us to think through some of the big problems in education. And next, um, I will share with you some of the context and how do you think about using context and, or leveraging a context to design and um, uh, research uh, program. And then we have to ask the relevant research question. And then we design an experiment that is actually uh, grounded in practice. So uh, the context that I'm going to show you is uh, bilingualism in the United States, uh, particularly in the education setting. And uh, my, uh, even though I'm currently in Canada, but uh, in the last few years, I have been working in the US. And so some of the work that I've been uh, sharing with you, I will be sharing with you today will be uh, coming from the United States. So in research, we like things to be black and white because it's um, easy to compare and it allows us to say something about differences. And in this case, uh, children who speak two languages versus children who speak one languages can be seen as black and white as the two groups that we compare. But in fact, bilingualism is a continuum. Now, if I were in uh, Singapore with you in person, I often ask the question in the audience, are you bilingual? And you can say yes, no, or I don't know. And usually that ends up with a conversation of uh, what is bilingualism. And everywhere I go, I ask this question in, in different uh, continents. And in, as particularly in Singapore, I have never had a hand put up and telling me that they're monolingual. Um, and so if we think of this way, if that's the research context and what, what about the context in education? In the US education, we don't have anything like monolinguals or bilinguals, but we have students who are categorized based on their proficiency in English. And on one end, you can see that there, we have a category of students who are proficient in English, meaning that they're ready to learn in English, uh, in, in an English um, mainstream classroom. On the other end, you see a lot of labels. These different labels are all used to describe children who are in the process of acquiring English as a second language. And if you speak English but learn French or learn um, another language, um, you are considered as English proficient. And so what was the specific context that I'm referring to here? So English learners are um, by far mostly concentrated in the um, southern border states and a couple of states that you see here in this map in darker green. 
And uh, some of the characteristics of these students is that uh, they're roughly equivalent to about 5 million in 2017 based on the NCES statistics. Majority of them are actually born in the United States. Now, even though Spanish is the most representative language among them, many of them speak a different language like Arabic or Haitian Creole or Brazilian Portuguese. And uh, very often you see them concentrated in urban schools. They experience very high dropout rates. Um, and in states that support gifted education, very few of them are identified as gifted. Um, many of them are also coming from low income background and they're also more likely to be identified as having specific learning disability, which is a category of special education. And so, in the United States, it was also really interesting that uh, the language status is also very confounded with economic status. Where I was in Massachusetts, if we look at the data back in 2018, 2019, if we look at um, pink area as in the children coming from a low income background and blue means they're not coming from a low income background, you can see that in third grade, roughly about 69,000 observations, a majority of the students who speak English as a second language are actually um, coming from a low income background, which is the smaller bar here in this mosaic graph. And the pattern is almost identical for grade five and grade eight. And so that means that if you speak English as a second language, you're more likely coming from a low income background. So in the case of considering academic achievement, we cannot ignore the fact that it's also related to the social um, economic background, um, as well as the resources that they have uh, access to beyond the school setting. So how about asking a question that is relevant to the reality and the experience of these children every day, but also allow us researchers to consider a design. And so this question is how different it is actually when learning a new knowledge in a first versus a second language, right? So we all know that it's gonna be harder when you're learning in a second language, but how much harder, how hard if we only look at outcomes, then we run into the issue of focusing on relative performance. One group is always going to be better than the others, and that's the outcome. But what we also um, are limiting our discourse is to show superiority or inferiority. And that's meaningful to some extent, but I think using neuroscience methods or using other scientific methods would allow us to shift the deficit-oriented description to focus on differences in order to think about what are the most sensitive ways to help these children. So from neuroscience, we know that bilingualism is associated with variations in brain structures in adults. Um, such as if I ask the question among adults and at what age did you start learning your second most proficient language, we know that the variation in a part of the brain called corpus callosum, it's related such that the earlier you learn a second language, uh, the more white matter you have. Now, this is a brain structure and um, it, it doesn't tell you how things are working with each other. It just tells you that there's the, the structure. And corpus callosum is an interesting Interesting structure because that's the part of the brain that connects our left and right hemisphere. Okay. And we also found the same relationship in adolescents, roughly about uh, 11 to, to uh, 15 years old. And the um, area of uh, correlation is slightly shifted to the posterior part of the brain. And in this uh, relationship, we control for biological sex, parental education, age, nonverbal IQ, um, et cetera. And so we know that the age at which you start learning another language changes brain structure. But what about brain functions? That's what allow us to say something about how they learn. 
And so we designed an experiment uh, by asking um, adolescents um, how, what do they know about uh, the earth? And we chose a topic from earth science in the Massachusetts curriculum. And of course, we want to make sure that they don't know what we're about to show them because otherwise we won't be able to test uh, how they learn new knowledge. And then we put uh, an, an adolescent into the MR scanner and I apologize for my very poor uh, PowerPoint skill. Um, no heads were hurt in this experiment. Everybody's head fits into this machine. Um, and in the scanner, we showed them a six and a half minute video about um, earth science. And we have an, uh, a narrator uh, standing here uh, on one side of the screen and we have static images on the other side as visual uh, support. And uh, the narrator here was actually a former teacher in a school in Boston teaching uh, science to um, linguistic diverse students. And then when they come out of the scanner, we capture their brain activity. We also ask them what they have learned in the video. And not only that, we also ask them specific questions so that we could grade, grade their performance like a teacher would using a rubric that we co-design with teachers. So using this experiment, uh, this is actually a, a part of the dissertation of my um, doctoral student, um, Sibylla Leon Guerrero, who just defended last Tuesday. Um, in language processing, we know that most of the processing um, in, it happens in the left hemisphere and it happens in the front part of the left hemisphere. Um, but we also know that uh, when this area is uh, processing language, it also you may use other parts of the brain, especially when you process in second language, we know that it would potentially make it um, more challenging and we should expect to see a more diffuse or distributed uh, brain network. And so I'm gonna show you uh, the video here on the top panel that uh, the rotating brain image here showing English speaking adolescents and the image below here show the correlation of different brain areas uh, in Spanish English bilingual adolescents when they're watching that earth science video. And in this case, you can see that it's much larger. And what about the other side of the, uh, of the brain? So there's another component of the brain that focus on language comprehension um, in the posterior part of the brain. And what about this brain area? Um, again, we see more um, correlation uh, of, with activity in this brain area on the other side of the hemisphere in the bilingual children. What it means is that we know that it's um, much more effortful and it needs different area, brain areas to support learning in a second language. But of course, I don't expect to scan every single student in order to figure out what's best for them. And in a transdisciplinary collaboration, we know that um, these children will need help in, in um, vocabulary, in their second language, and also their syntactic structures. Not only that, but we also know that their first language knowledge supports learning in a second language. So knowing more Spanish is not going to uh, diminish your performance in English. And most importantly, we, the next question we ask is how to leverage language su to support literacy in, in bilingual children. And the key question that we designed this experiment to ask is how do we differentiate developing uh, second uh, language literacy skills from reading disability? When a child struggles to read, it is very difficult to find out what they are uh, experiencing. Do they just need more time to learn a second language or do they actually need a special education or intervention like Professor Hedy has uh, mentioned? So where do we go next? Um, we don't stop here. That was only a very beginning journey of a much larger research program to figure out what are the most sensitive ways linguistically to support these learners. And I can do it by myself. I have to work with other people like educators, parents, and also other cognitive neuroscientists. And the importance here is to build bridges, okay? And so uh, just to recap, um, we need to think about teams uh, in order to do a successful transdisciplinary program. We also need to think about context and the work that I've presented to you is very specific to the North American context. 
but we have to leverage what we know about science um, and science of learning, especially in cognitive neuroscience, to design a sensitive experiments. We need to ask questions in a way that is relevant to practice, but also um, allow researchers to design an experiment. And we also have to think about designing an experiment that is going to be meaningful and transferable. Um, I won't be able to show you my other line of work that looks at uh, bilingualism in, as an interaction experience with uh, family, school, and community, but I hope I have that chance next time. Um, and thank you very much. All the work is spun by this amazing team of students of mine. Thank you. Thank you, Gigi. Um, and I'm glad we are building bridges between Singapore and Canada. I, I know it's really late over there, and I hope you can stay awake just, just a wee bit more. Um, our third speaker is uh, Tio Wei Ping from our very own National Institute of Education. Wei Ping is from the Physical Education and Sports Science Academic Group, and his research focuses on understanding the mechanisms that underpin movement and learning across the lifespan and in diseased populations. In particular, Wei Ping specializes in several neuroimaging and brain stimulation techniques, such as EEG, functional near infrared spectroscopy, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, and transcranial direct current stimulation to understand neurophysiology and movement control. He is involved in several international collaborations aimed at understanding the role of exercise and dietary habits on cognitive function and brain health across the lifespan. Wei Ping will be sharing with us the topic, is neuroimaging ready for the classroom? Wei Ping, over to you. Thank you very much, Dennis. Um, and thank you everyone for um, attending this talk. Um, it is a great pleasure for me to be presenting um, some of my work, well, uh, or at least an introduction of what uh, I plan to do here. Um, and of course, I'm very honored to be in the same room as uh, Professor John Hattie and Professor Gigi Lok as well, who are obviously uh, the big guns in this science of learning arena. Um, so as Dennis has mentioned earlier on, um, I'm not necessarily an educator myself. I was not um, trained as a teacher. Um, I was trained as a sports scientist, so that was my, my uh, background. Um, and I did my PhD uh, in neuroscience or motor neuroscience or movement neuroscience. And one of the things that I was really interested in uh, understanding is how our body controls movement right, uh, in particularly from a brain's perspective. And I think working uh, a lot with um, clinical populations, so people like stroke, Parkinson's disease, and even in dementia, we actually see a very close relationship between um, our executive function or our ability to think and our ability to move, right? So um, how all these relate together has sort of sparked my interest in trying to understand or at least better understand how our brain is involved in, uh, in our daily lives, our daily actions, and how can we accurately measure these responses in the brain, right? Um, so my talk over here, or, or at least my talk, is, is really, uh, um, and very much coincidentally, a, a, a transition from what uh, Professor Lok has mentioned earlier on about transdisciplinary research, uh, where myself, um, I have to work very closely with educators teachers on the ground as well to develop um, paradigms that would be more reflective of what's happening in the classrooms um, so that we can better understand um, learning dynamics in those classrooms, all right? So how did it all begin? Um, so as Dennis mentioned, uh, I, I, a lot of my work involves understanding lifespan development, in particular, our ability to move. So from a, a young infant, how does uh, this infant develop the ability to stand up uh, and then to crawl, to walk? Um, and of course, during our, uh, our adult life, how do we maintain those movements? How do we learn and how do we optimize movements? And of course, into the older age, whereby how can we prevent the decline in, in, in our movement abilities? Um, another area of work that I often uh, uh, work within is to really understand how we control these movements, right? So um, I use a lot of clinical models uh, of, of uh, movement um, deficits, um, and we use a lot of imaging techniques to try to understand or better understand how these deficits or where these deficits stem from um, and how can we rectify uh, these issues. 
And of course, I, I guess the last bit of my, of my work is to really understand how can we stimulate the brain um, in order for us to optimize brain function. Um, and one of those techniques, obviously, uh, is, is via exercise, uh, which, which I guess in my department, physical uh, education and sports science, um, this is something that we focus quite a, quite a bit on. So this is essentially uh, a, a, a coverage of what I do predominantly. Um, and I guess one, one aspect of doing all these three uh, forms of research have sort of, sort of led me to think about how can I measure brain responses, um, especially when the participants is involved with exercise or the participants are involved with uh, specific forms of movement. So as Professor Lok has, uh, has very nicely identified earlier on, um, one of the ways that we would often use to measure brain responses or look at the brain uh, um, uh, in detail is through magnetic resonance imaging or MRI, right? So uh, this is a very typical image that you would, uh, uh, that you would see um, in papers or in, or, or in articles. Um, we put someone in a scanner um, and we can get very detailed information about brain structure, um, brain function, and potentially even connectivity between brain areas. Um, MRI is also the gold standard way of measuring brain activity and brain responses. Um, and, and, and we sort of benchmark most of our neuroimaging uh, um, results or tests uh, based on the MRI test that we get. The other method that we would often use as well is, another, uh, is a method called electroencephalography or EEG for short. Um, some of you guys might know this. Um, and again, this is a very old technique. It's, it's definitely older than MRI. Um, it's been around for more than half a, uh, half a century. Um, and essentially, it's measuring the neuronal responses or, or the electrical fields that's produced by our neurons within the brain. And based on those changes um, by, by inducing different conditions, um, we can, I guess, hypothesize or we can get an idea of how brain activity alters during different states. For example, from a, uh, um, from a resting state to a more active state where, we're, where we are thinking a lot um, or during different conditions as well. So as, as what Professor Locke has mentioned earlier on, um, we sort of plan some of our paradigms to elicit all these different responses for us to get a, a better idea of what happens within the brain. Now, obviously using these sorts of modalities, um, the advantages are that we can get very detailed information from MRI and from EEG. Um, the sources of data that we collect are very rich. Um, say, if we look at MRI image, for example, we can look at changes in structure, um, so how the brain changes with age or with, with some sort of injury. Um, uh, and, I, and I also mentioned earlier on that MRI is, is still currently our gold standard of measuring brain activity as well. Um, and because these techniques have been around for many, many years, um, EEG and MRI, um, there's, there's actually a large database of past information that we can get access to. Um, so there, there is, uh, there's a lot of information now that are available um, that as neuroscientists, we can get access and we can look at different correlations or different patterns of activity um, with very specific uh, paradigms that they have used. Now, of course, one of the uh, there are obviously disadvantages with some of these neuroimaging modalities as well. Um, firstly, obviously, costs is a factor um, to build an MRI or to, uh, to build an MRI facility it is uh, quite costly. Um, results are mostly correlational and not necessarily causational. All right. So we can't really infer causation based on uh, uh, neuroimaging findings. Um, and I think as well, I think this question was again uh, uh, highlighted by uh, Professor Locke, um, uh, uh, whereby what is the ecological validity in real world setting, right? So if we put someone in a scanner and someone's lying down flat uh, or, or supine, uh, in a supine position, how does lying in a supine position inform us about activity or brain processes when we are running? or when we are walking, or potentially even when we are in a classroom, right? So can we create the same sensory uh, environment, the same physical act uh, within a scanner? Um, I guess the, the, the answer at this point is, is no, right? So 
how then can we translate information um, that we know from MRI or from EEG, whereby a lot of the paradigms are sort of seated or lying down to, to an environment that is a bit more dynamic in nature. So this is where I guess my thought process often comes in. Um, we know that in a very static environment, if the person is lying down or if the participant is sit seated on chair, we can measure brain responses quite well, right? But in our daily activity, so for example, in this uh, animation over here, so if we consider walking, right? So we walk everywhere um, and we walk in a very high, uh, we walk in a dynamic environment as well. So as we walk, sometimes we encounter obstacles. So for example, steps over here. Um, how do we know what sort of brain processes are involved in these activities, such as walking? Um, how do we know what happens when we decide to change our course of action? So for example, if we, if we approach a flight of steps, how do we know uh, uh, what's going on in the brain to change that, uh, that pattern of movement, right? Um, and even, even if, if, if we were just walking uh, uh, on the road, um, we get sensory stimulation um, you know, via our visual senses, via our auditory senses, um, sights and sounds. Um, that, that occur as well. So we are constantly trying to pay attention to what's going on, right? So it is not just the act of walking alone, but we have all these other multiple sources of information, sensory information that our brain has to deal with in order for us to walk successfully from point A to point B. So I guess this sort of leads me to uh, uh, the, the crux of my presentation over here is that Apart from the traditional methods of measuring brain responses, um, we do have new generation technology or, or, or techniques uh, that, are, uh, that have been introduced, I would say in the last maybe 10 years, 15 years. Um, they've been used, I guess, maybe a little bit longer in certain fields, but at least in terms of education, I think we are starting to sort of see um, uh, uh, research using some of these techniques a lot more uh, in, in, a, in, in an environment that is, I would say, more ecologically valid or more representative of what's happening in schools or in the classroom. So just one, uh, um, I'm going to do a, a bit of a shameless plug over here. Um, this, uh, these pictures are from our new center. Um, and part, as part of this new center, uh, we do have some portable neuroimaging equipment that, that, uh, that we would, use, would be using. Um, and this is one of them, functional near-infrared spectroscopy. Um, and if you guys were early enough to catch the, the starting video, um, this is one of the techniques that we uh, are, are pushing um, as, as, uh, as a technique that we can employ within the classrooms itself. Now, this technique has been around, I would say, for the last 20 years. Um, it is, it's, it's not an MRI. Uh, uh, it's not directly... Uh, uh, comparable to MRI, but some of the measures that we collect are highly reliable to some of the MRI measures that, that, that we collect as well. Um, the other form of neuroimaging, again, EEG over here, I think EEG has progressed quite a fair bit. Um, there are now portable systems, uh, which we actually use in sports science um, to measure brain responses to different activities. So as you can see in this slide over here, um, this rock climber is actually wearing an EEG cap um, and he is actually performing uh, a, a task that is, that is uh, highly uh, valid in the context in which he is, uh, in, in which he needs to do, right? So the, these are just, I guess, uh, across disciplinary skills um, that, uh, that uh, some of these techniques have been used in other fields, uh, but now we're sort of slowly seeing some of these techniques being employed um, in an education setting. Um, and I guess apart from some of these new equipment and new techniques that we see, um, we also need to consider how some of these tests or some of these paradigms are being performed. Um, if you look at this video over here, this is actually a video of one of my past students when I was uh, at Deakin University in Melbourne. Um, and as you can see, this is a very traditional um, cognitive neuroscience paradigm that we get participants to do, whereby they look at a screen, 
um, and they push a button when they see a stimuli uh, uh, on the screen and they try to inhibit their responses um, if they see another stimuli, all right? So the thing I'm trying to highlight over here is that when we look at the traditional uh, cognitive neuroscience papers or research that we do, a lot of all these paradigms are created um, to specifically target a, a specific domain of cognition or, or executive functioning. Um, and they are sort of created as well to give the neuroimaging technique the best possible chance of detecting a change in the brain. Um, as, you, as, as you can imagine, brain changes occur very quickly um, and they're usually very minute in nature as well. So in order for us to really detect what's going on in the brain, we have to give uh, uh, the brain the chance to actually showcase or to, to be able to activate some of these pathways, right? So if you look at this paradigm over here, which is uh, actually a go-no-go -go task to look at inhibition, um, this is what is, is often being used in MRI and even with some of these newer neuroimaging models as well, um, which may not necessarily translate to what we would do in the classroom, right? So what can neuroscience uh, or what can some of these neuroimaging techniques do for us? Um, I think based on the evidence that is sort of showing uh, uh, in more recent years, so this, this paper was probably one of the first few papers that I've, uh, that I've seen back in 2017. Um, and this paper by Dicker, um, I believe this is actually a Dutch group. Um, Suzanne Dicker, I believe, uh, is the first author. And she was probably the first one that demonstrated that we could essentially apply some of these neuroscientific techniques um, in classrooms, right? So this study um, uh, uh, or this technique of scanning multiple brains simultaneously, or what we call hyperscanning, um, looks at brain-to-brain -brain synchrony. So if we have multiple neuroimaging sets that we can bring into the classrooms, and in some cases, some of these uh, imaging devices are actually not that expensive anymore. Um, we can scan multiple brains at the same time, and we can look at how these brains react to one another as well. Um, so this figure was actually, uh, I've, I've taken this figure from the paper. Um, and essentially, they were looking at a classroom of 15 students, looking at a STEM subject, I believe it was biology. Um, they even scanned the teacher's brains as well together with the student. Um, and here, what we can see is that based on this group dynamics, we can actually get a sense of what the group or what sort of synchrony the group has together as a whole. Um, we can even look at things like how, does, how do the students react to the teacher? So the synchrony of the, the students and the teacher itself. And of course, we can even look at um, synchrony between each subject, right? So how does uh, pupil A respond to pupil B, right? So we are starting to now see more and more of these hyperscanning techniques coming into play um, that we can apply in a, in a classroom setting. Now, this technique over here does not necessarily rely on the traditional neuroimaging paradigms where where we have to present uh, a stimuli in a, in a particular order. So this, we can, using this technique, we can actually have an actual live classroom going on and we can collect data uh, simultaneously uh, from the, the individuals as well. And of course, depending on how many headsets we've got, um, we can do multiple, or we can image multiple brains at the same time. So, what then, based on the evidence so far, and uh, uh, so since 2017, there are other groups as well that have uh, done this uh, synchrony method or hyperscanning method um, in classroom education, um, and even in social neuroscience as well, looking at be social behaviors between uh, parent, and, uh, parent and child, um, even between romantic partners as well, um, even between, uh, 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 between genders, right? So, um, there, there is also evidence or there are also more recent papers looking at um, team sports, whereby we are looking at, let's say, paired, uh, paired sports uh, uh, so we can image the brain of two uh, uh, opposing uh, players playing each other, or we can also image the brain between two uh, players that are partners in that same sport, right? So how, 
those two brains are actually in synchrony as they play that particular sport. So what does hyperscanning or, or brain synchrony actually represent? Um, as, as I mentioned, uh, this field is still quite young, uh, but based on whatever the available evidence that we've got, it seems to indicate that if we have higher synchrony between uh, two individuals, um, that may signify social connectedness. Um, so i.e. Uh, those two individuals may be uh, more connected to one another. And we sort of see that uh, when we look at uh, romantic partners, obviously. Um, we also uh, believe that this higher form of brain synchrony um, uh, 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 may be representative of social behavioral synchrony as well. All right. So uh, if you look at a classroom setting, um, learning is a very social affair, right? And we always talk about so, the, so, the social emotional uh, uh, state when we, when we talk about learning. Um, we could potentially use a technique like this to measure the, the intersynchrony between uh, uh, within a group setting to look at how interrelated socially uh, and from a neural perspective, uh, this group behaves within that particular classroom. Um, Thirdly, social engagement, of course. So the more socially engaged you are with someone else, um, so and that person is socially engaged to you, um, we do see an increase in brain synchrony. Um, and I think one, one area or one aspect that, uh, that could potentially relate to the classroom is um, this uh, concept of cooperation, problem solving, and creativity as well. So again, in a group dynamic setting, uh, uh, if the students are cooperating with one another and they're solving problems um, and collaborating with one another. Um, studies have sort of shown, or at least uh, in, in pilot studies that, uh, that have shown, um, that this interbrain synchrony is, is actually a lot higher compared to when you're trying to problem solve uh, by yourself, or even if you're in a group uh, and, and you are just sort of working as an individual, um, the synchrony between that group is actually quite low. Okay, so just to put, uh, just to maybe put things into a bit of a perspective, um, this was actually a paper that I read um, a couple of years ago, uh, uh, just when it first came out, um, from class, uh, from laboratory to the classroom, right? The potential of using um, uh, of using portable neuroimaging devices in educational neuroscience. Um, this is actually a Brazilian group, so I uh, I will confess that this is not a study that's being done by myself. I'm just using. Uh, the, the resources that they have provided. So if you are keen on understanding a little bit more about this paper, you can download this paper. Um, and I think what they've done over here is actually to showcase how some of these neuroimaging device, um, FNIRS here, they're, they're, they're using, um, it can be used in, in, a, in a teaching context or in an educational context. Um, so I'm going to play this video um, and we will see if we can actually hear um, and see what they do. Cinco, seis, sete, oito, nove, dez. Deu, ó, foi até aqui, deu até o um nove. Tudo bem? Nove. Então você vai andar nove casinhas. Conta aqui comigo de novo, vai. Um, um dois, três, quatro, cinco, seis. Ok, so what this study or what this uh, case study, uh, I, I should say, um, because it's only just uh, these two individuals, we have a, a young child and a teacher. Um, so what this case study is trying to demonstrate over here is the synchrony between two brain regions of these two individuals. Um, we have the prefrontal cortex or the, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex over here. Um, in this case, it's on the right side. Um, and it, uh, 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 temporal parietal junction over here, which is sort of involved in uh, mental uh, mentation, mental skills, uh, uh, these sorts of functions. And so what they have sort of suggested is that when two individuals, a student and a teacher, are socially connected um, and they're socially engaged with the particular task, that the interrelatedness or the connectivity between these two individuals of these two brain regions are uh, a lot higher in, in, in this sense, right? So uh, this is just one aspect that we can potentially use uh, uh, cognitive neuroscience or neuroimaging techniques quite well and, and quite easily in a very ecological uh, type of environment 
Okay, so they have got three videos from this uh, from this paper. I'm going to play you the second video. So this second video is uh, uh, is slightly different. Now, what this group is trying to demonstrate is uh, uh, imaging of, of four different students. So we have uh, four subjects over here. Um, and these four subjects are trying to pay attention to uh, this teacher that is uh, going to teach them something. All right, so I'm going to play the video right now. Então, a gente vai iniciar a aula. É, eu coloquei essas abelhas aqui não só porque eu acho elas extremamente interessantes, né, como biólogo, o cérebro delas encantadores. Ao final da aula. Gente... Right. So again, uh, what we are seeing over here is that there is the potential for such techniques, even in a group environment. And looking at students' uh, so-called uh, so attentiveness or attention to a particular teacher in the front. Um, of course, if we had more, uh, if, if this group had more headsets, um, the, the teacher could be wearing one as well. Um, and we can look at the synchrony between the teacher and students and students amongst each other paying attention. Um, and for, uh, for this particular video, I think uh, they were looking at the prefrontal area, which is just the area uh, in the front over here that's involved with, um, uh, uh, of, which is involved in executive functioning, working memory, attention, uh, 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 those sorts of function, all right? And the last video over here from this particular paper um, looks at the combination of various different techniques, right? So um, we have got two different techniques that are, uh, that are available on this video. Uh, one of them is, again, the brain uh, scanning system. And the other system is the eye tracking system, whereby we track the, the pupil or the movement of the pupil uh, um, uh, from an individual. So I'm going to play the video now. O seu sistema solar. Aí um pouquinho mais pertinho dele, vem um planeta chamado Mercúrio. Tudo bem? Planeta pequenininho. Se ele está bem perto do Sol, você acha que ele é quente ou frio? Quente. É bem, 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 bem quente. Muito bem. Depois dele vem um outro, que se chama Vênus. Tá certo? Tá só um pouquinho mais afastado. So as you can see from this video, um, we have got multiple data sources that we can obviously tap on. We have got um, equipment that, or we can, uh, that we can measure the eye gaze, uh, which looks at where you're looking at and which sort of represents uh, attention of a particular area or a particular uh, 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 um, focus in, in that space. Um, and we can also time map or time lock it to uh, brain responses as well, um, based on the behavioral outcome, so i.e. the level of gaze that we get uh, from, from these two systems. And based on that, we can get a, a, we can get a very nice representation of what's happening um, at a neural level or at, at a more uh, brain level, what's going on in relation to uh, a, a very obvious behavioral outcome, which is in this sense, um, the eye tracking or eye gaze uh, um, system over here. So I guess in, in a nutshell, what I'm trying to uh, demonstrate over here, or at least based from, uh, from some of these findings, is that we are now starting to see more and more of these devices that are portable, uh, that are relatively cheaper, uh, available commercially as well um, in the market uh, that we can bring into sort of a, a classroom setup or a classroom setting, and we can record data uh, that, that is quite robust in, in that sense, that will give us an understanding of what's happening, on, what's happening in the brain and also what's happening from a behavioral point of view. So I guess, where do we then go from here? Can we start using neuroimaging in classrooms or in schools? Um, I think at this point, uh, my, my own personal opinion is that we are probably still a little bit early in terms of our research to really say that, you know, these sort of devices can be implemented in schools or schools can start buying them and look at uh, uh, how students behave and how students are paying attention in class. It's probably, it's, it's probably still a bit too early um, in, my, in my opinion. Um, but what we can potentially do is to leverage on some sort of experimental setup. So if we can have uh, a mock-up classroom whereby we know what's going on. So it's sort of a semi-controlled environment. 
but still have the elements of teaching, of group dynamics happening, um, and we know what's happening at specific time points, then potentially we can actually use some of these uh, neuroimaging uh, systems to make sense of what's going on. Of course, uh, uh, at NIE, we tend to always work very closely with our MOE partners to, un to really understand what do they want out of this science of learning or what do they want out of this sort of neuroimaging techniques. And we can sort of cater or, or we can design a specific research paradigm or specific research question um, that would maximize the use of neuroimaging, but also some of the behavioral techniques um, from the learning sciences. Um, so which sort of brings me to my next point, like how can we then maximize or optimize the use of neuroimaging in education, right? So I think large, uh, I think this, is, uh, 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 this should be for all research is that it needs to be hypothesis driven um, education research questions. So education or educators need to drive the, the, the research question, right? So us as neuroscientists or myself as a, as a neuroscientist, I would like to know what are some of the issues that you guys face um, and how can we value add or provide that expertise to help you problem solve or provide some, some answers to the questions that you wanna ask, right? We may not be able to solve everything, but if we can bring you one step or two steps closer to your answer, then I think that, uh, that, that is quite a, a good collaboration, all right? Um, the other thing as well is that uh, potentially if we can leverage on, on, on the, you know, the uh, semi-controlled classrooms environment, which we have here at the Science of Learning and Education Center, we can, we can use or we can really utilize some of these techniques um, through observation, through video analysis, um, and to really understand what sort of brain responses and what sort of behavioral responses uh, are happening during a live teaching class, right? So again, this really uh, reinforces this collaboration between neuroscientists and educational researchers or even practitioners that are on the ground that may potentially not have access to some of these tools. Um, we, we can definitely support, uh, we are more than happy to support these forms of collaborations. Um, and lastly, of course, uh, uh, with new, newer met methods of data analytics, um, we are obviously hoping to combine some of these methods together with learning sciences, together with educators and neuroscience um, to really create this transdisciplinary or multidisciplinary environment um, for us to really answer some of the big blue sky questions in education. So I think uh, I'm done with, um, uh, this ends my talk. Um, be happy to answer any questions from you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, Weiping, for the fantastic presentation. Uh, we now have the panel discussion. There are lots of questions coming in and we're running a little longer than expected. So bear with us as we introduce our moderator who will bring us through the questions and discussion. Azi Lawati Jamaluddin is Assistant Dean, Science of Learning at the National Institute of Education. Her research interests are in uh, learning theories of embodiment, perception, and cognition, as well as social, cultural, biological, and neurocorrelates of learning. She leads the play game-based learning research strand and science of learning initiatives at the Office of Education Research. She is principal investigator of multiple national funded research projects and has published in several international journals in the areas of innovation, as well as innovation change, scaling, and translation. Azi, over to you. Thank you, Dennis, for having me moderate this panel discussion. And of course, to our three speakers, earlier speakers, for their sharings. Now, before we get into an interactive panel dialogue, I thought I'd just preamble our panel discussion with quick rise above or synthesis from the three presentations earlier, which I feel point us towards very important areas for the science of learning. So as you know, John talks about where we are headed with regards to our students' self-regulation skills and being capable to teach themselves, developing mind frames that allow them to drive their learning progressions. Gigi articulated an example of interdisciplinary research that puts knowledge from neuroscience into a context and this, in this context is in education and how we move from understanding individual differences in linguistic background that's informed by neuroscientific and behavioral in investigations to nuancing more sensitive pedagogical support for the linguistic diverse group of learners that she's working with. And of course, uh, Wei Ping ended off um, the series of presentations 
presentation by highlighting issues of ecological validity. Um, he highlighted the affordances of science of learning modalities of which um, neuroimaging is you know, it's a central part of the kinds of measures that we collect in science of learning. You know, he shared with us um, some of the affordances of hyperscanning, integrating some of the social contexts of neuroimaging data. And of course, I'm um, ending off with um, a rather provocative question on whether we are ready for the classroom. And I think these are really important areas related to changing contexts, particularly in us imagining educational futures, where the science of learning findings are not just, you know, able to inform us about differences, um, individual or group differences that are nuanced through biological measures, but also how we bridge some of these science of learning understandings into education. And I think all three speakers alluded to this bridge from areas of neuroscience, areas of psychology um, into education. So I'm just going to kick off this panel discussion, you know, in extending these ideas about the interdisciplinary, the multidisciplinary and the transdisciplinary bridges that the three speakers have alluded to. And um, I'm going to be um, uh, posing this first question to our first speaker, John. And I think, John, you might be familiar with the translational framework. I think it was also a piece that was in your edited book with um, Jared Hovath as well as Jason Lodge from the laboratory to the classroom, where there was this articulation of a translational framework for science of learning, where we move across different kinds of bridges. So there's this conceptual bridge that will give us, you know, um, understanding at the theoretical level for how we can explain um, what are some of the learning mechanisms that, our, that are being experienced by our learners. But this conceptual bridge is still silent in terms of what are the kinds of practices that can be undertaken in the classroom or in a learning environment or in a learning con con uh, construct. So um, this idea of a prescriptive bridge um, still seem to be um, rather limited for now. And I wonder whether you can touch upon this idea of um, this pre prescriptiveness of some of our science of learning understandings, particularly, you know, earlier you talked about how we need to move from teachers talking to um, teacher triage. And we know like in parallel in, in medicine and in public health, when we talk about triage, it's really about identifying, you know, prescription to remedy some of the situation or some of the illnesses that are coming in um, and diagnosed in the triage um, room. So I wonder whether you can speak to some of these, um, the notion of prescriptive bridges in science of learning. Over to you, John. Well, thanks, Azzy. I, I think it's a bridge too far at the moment, as many others have argued. But, I, but my argument would be, at this time, I think that's why we need the kind of work that you've talked about today, where we can speed up the relationships between the disciplines and how they can inform what happens in the classroom. I have a hunch it's going to go the other way, and that we're going to get better understandings from the neurological uh, methodologies that uh, Weeping talked about, about explaining some of the things that are happening in the classrooms. I'm not sure there'll be uh, a few years yet before it goes the other direction where the neuropsychology will actually inform the teachers. But going the other way, I think there is a lot of work going on now in some of the special education areas, um, as um, Gigi talked about in the uh, uh, bilingual and language areas, of having to explain what's happening. And as a researcher, explanation of what's happening in the classroom is as critical as predictions and any other things we do. And so, yes, I think that we are moving into a stage that through the combined methods, the different ways of thinking about this, that we're bringing a whole arsenal of new technologies and tools to help better explain what's happening into the classrooms. And I think that's a very, very powerful method. Someone sooner or later is going to make the big breakthrough in helping teachers see the world differently. And that's the aim of what I think we need to do in the next five to 10 years. Right. Thanks, John. And I think um, earlier, Gigi alluded to, you know, key areas. And one of the things that she highlighted was, you know, the team composition. And I think there's also a question that's coming in for Gigi with regards to team composition. When we talk about bringing people together, so bringing someone um, who has a psychology background, someone who has a neuroscience background or an educator. Now, um, 
would we need to take into consideration the need for a mix of the epistemological perspectives or researchers? As you know, um, from with different backgrounds, we have different beliefs of how knowledge is constructed, different beliefs of how learning processes should take place. So could you perhaps, you know, Gigi, just um, elaborate a little bit more on your position on how, say, cultural psychology or how enculturation in learning is considered in your research on the brain processes? Oh, definitely. Um, thank you, Asi, and thank you for the uh, attendee to raise this question. Um, I think it's very important for people who work together to have a deeper knowledge of other people's perspective, uh, such that like you not only have to uh, bring in your own expertise, but you're also learning from others. So in a way, the ecology of the team, it's almost like learning from each other rather than just... Um, going through what our discipline is like. So um, for example, my training is in psychology and neuroscience. Uh, but when I started uh, doing work in education, I, I would uh, sit in classroom to do classroom observations. I would learn about what teachers are going through every day. And then I talk to families and see what kind of questions do they have in mind. And of course, as a psychologist, I observe children's learning in, in a naturalistic setting. And these experiences, even though I can't write it in papers, I can't put it in my presentation, but it frames me and it also situates me in a way to ask questions that are more relevant. And of course, we don't stop talking to each other. It's on the team formation. It's for everybody to bring in their expertise in, um, in a manner that other people can learn. So I have to explain neuroscience or the design or lim limitations of research to educators. And in terms of uh, culture, that's actually a really big part of the, uh, the framework that I have been sharing, um, in particular in education. So what I share with you, as I mentioned in the presentation, it's very North American, in particular in United States. Now, because in the United States, most classrooms are operating in English, uh, there are some numbers of classroom which has uh, dual language learning. But in Singapore, for example, dual language education is almost everywhere. Uh, last time I visited Singapore, um, I visited a childcare center where one teacher used um, Malay, I think, and then the other teacher used English. And it's very prevalent. And I remember I just go to a market and because I look like a person from Singapore, um, people would talk to me in all different languages and dialects in one sentence. And I can only understand the English words. And so culture, it's a very important part in applying successfully what we think of um, as usable or translatable, uh, translatable knowledge from cognitive neuroscience to education. Thanks, Gigi. Now, um, you know, when we talk about applying understandings from cognitive neuroscience into education and um, Weiping actually alluded to, you know, integrating some of these um, science of learning modalities into the classroom. So this would be a question for Weiping. Now, Weiping, in light of, you know, the global contextual change we, which John and Gigi has also alluded to, um, where learning does not necessarily take place within the classroom, um, rather learning could be taking place anywhere else, you know, as, um, you know, COVID has shown us uh, the contexts of learning has moved beyond just the physical constraints of the classroom. So what would be, um, you know, some of your reactions to this uh, contextual changes of learning? And the other question that's kind of like related with regards to contextual change of learning is, you know, when um, neuroimaging typically has been associated with understanding of, you know, the individual characteristics, the individual biological characteristics of learner, but you also showed very interesting um, possibilities with regards to how we move from just individual understandings towards more social connectors, connectedness through your hyperscanning example. So, so you know, um, this would be the, the question that's being posed to you. First would be the changing contexts of learning. And next would be, you know, some of the possibilities of science of learning modalities for these new contexts of learning. Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much, Azi. Um, I think uh, very pertinent questions here, um, considering uh, our 
the, the global changes that are occurring. And I think it's not only just within Singapore or within Australia or within, uh, it's, it's, it's really a global change. In today's context, we get information freely and easily, right? So if you go onto YouTube or if you go anywhere, you go onto a website, you can get very good quality information already, right? So I, I think that in terms of the, the neuroscience or at least the cognitive neuroscience or this, the, 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 the uh, learning sciences research, um, this is a change that is, uh, that is going to happen in any case, whether or not COVID happened. I think COVID was, was really a catalyst that sort of spurred uh, 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 institutions, like schools, uh, the, the, the IHLs to, to rethink and readapt the way we, the, the, the way we learn. Now, how neuroscience or how some of these neuroimaging techniques can play a part, um, I, I think in, in this sense, uh, uh, again, like I mentioned earlier on in my talk, uh, uh, to bring some of these neuroscience techniques into the real world at this point, I think we are probably still too early for that. Um, we don't really have uh, tried and tested paradigms to, to look at some of these social relationships yet. Um, and I was sort of reading through some of these questions as well. Uh, and rightly pointed out by by some of the, the the attendees that you know how do we how do we know whether someone's socially connected or interconnected? And this is this is I guess why we sort of need to work together with uh, with with this, uh, transdisciplinary people or transdisciplinary teams to really identify um, what is what is what's the definition of being so socially connected, right? Um, I myself, uh, I, I again. Being socially connected is not necessarily my expertise of work, but I would sort of imagine that if this is a, a, a question that we could co be collaborating with other partners, with other uh, experts or other practitioners, then I think we can, e we can easily overcome these issues. Um, I think one aspect of looking at this uh, 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 shift in, 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 this, uh, in the way we we learn things whether we now become more so socially uh, uh, isolated because of lockdowns, because of restriction. I think this is, a, this is a good testing ground to see whether or not some of our hypothesis or some of these learning theories still hold true, right? And we can use neuroscience and we can use cognitive science to help answer those, answer those questions. Thanks, Wei Ping. Um, I think the the current trust or the you know um, the resonant theme across the the sharings that has been um, shared by the three speakers is really about um, the change you know when we have go global contextual change uh, and and you know when science of learning findings are coming in what are some of the things that it's going to be changing and I think um, John Ali earlier earlier alluded to like um, you know giving students a lot more agency than they traditionally have been um, given and how can we actually address some of these changes through working with our educators which which both Gigi and Weeping has alluded to. So the question now that has been posed is that the change and suggestion that the science of learning bring about um, has actually um, arose this fear of displacement in the current set of teachers. So how can we best manage this change process? And I think, um, you know, this question could potentially be answered by John, given that um, you have highlighted how um, teachers should be addressing some of these contextual changes for learning and how we're going to be seeing students with a lot more different um, skills and dispositions that are preparing them for a future of imagination. So, you know, how can we actually address some of this fear of displacement? Well, I think that COVID gave us the opportunity to uh, force us to, to change. And I think many teachers, if, if, if anybody says teachers can't change, they just do not, do not understand what happened last year. And so I think that, um, yes, there is a fear of displacement because there are hierarchies in schools. There's hierarchy of subjects, there's hierarchy of students, there's hierarchy of teachers' roles. Um, but COVID disrupted all that. And so this move that we are, all three of us have been talking about today, is this move from the focus on teaching to this focus on learning. And then it begs the questions learning about, 
um, who's making the benefits from the learning, how much is the learning. But there's also that important imperative to worry about the right time. Um, there is a right time to focus on the content and the facts. There's a right time to focus on the relationships and the problem solving. And that's why I want to put a lot more emphasis on the task analysis in terms of the skills and the thinking that's needed. Uh, when you go into many classrooms, most times you don't hear students thinking aloud. And there's a right time to do that too. And there's a wrong time to do that. But I think that um, teachers have learned last year that many of them can switch to a more triage approach. They can switch to having the students taking on more responsibility to becoming their own teachers. And as I said at the start of my talk, my fear is we'll go back and in five years' time, we'll see COVID as a history blimp that didn't have no effect. I think that's very, very sad. So, yeah, there's a fear of displacement. But last year, virtually every teacher in the world dealt with that. I just don't want us to go back to the old normal. Thanks, John. So, you know, we um, a lot of times the focus on understanding individual differences with regards to, you know, this advancing field of science of learning is really for the learners. But we've also talked about how teachers need to be equipped with the right kind of um, pedagogical repertoire, for example, to be, to be able to address some of these um, new um, kinds of teaching methods or new pedagogies to, to equip our students for, you know, a reimagined future. So I wonder whether in terms of some of the science of learning findings, whether they might be better, better able inform us on how we can actually work with teachers to either catalyze the pedagogical repertoire in harnessing science of learning findings and implement it in the classroom, or whether um, certain professional development programs for teachers can be designed with some science of learning understandings. And I wonder whether Gigi might be able to address this question. Yes, um, thank you, I see for this question. Um, I absolutely agree with you. I, I think uh, not only we focus on the student, but we also focus on the teachers because teaching and learning are tightly coupled that we can't really separate one from another. And so um, in terms of professional development, I often think of it as a way that I usually call knowledge mobilization rather than professional development, because it's not only that we researchers have something to offer, because educators have something to offer for us. And so that's something that I have been thinking about a lot is, um, for example, when schools um, want me to go give a talk um, and they say, oh, uh, teachers can use it for professional development hours. And then I would always say like, yes, they, they, they get credit for the time that they spend at the talk. But at the same time, I also want to frame it as um, a knowledge exchange session rather than a professional development session, because it's not only that I, I have something to share and I, um, as, um, as, as Taewon mentioned, like, we are not trained to teach in a classroom and we don't always have something to offer as to tell teacher what to do in their classroom. But what we can do is to use our scientific knowledge to share with teachers what they don't otherwise observe in classroom behavior. And so under, uh, understanding learning um, differences and developmental differences is very important. Um, I'll give you one example. So if we look at Com comparing performance, behavioral outcome, there's always the, a better group or a worse group, or you're learning faster, I'm learning slower. And so, but using looking at brain functions or structure is slightly different. There's no better brain or worse brain, but you can look at different brain patterns. And of course, that's more at an individual level, but at a group level, like the research I showed you, we can then make a statement about uh, the underlying uh, cognitive processes that are supported by the brain regions that we observed in the different groups of children. Thanks, Gigi. And I especially like, you know, you highlighting the, the idea of the white matter in the corpus callosum because I remember reading an article about Einstein having a colossal corpus callosum and whether that can potentially, you know, contribute towards his um, spectacular intelligence. Now, I think um, with regards to Gigi's clear articulation on, you know, the 
the partnership between neuroscientists or psychologists with educators and how um, some of the problems that drive science of learning research is really emerging from classroom practices, the, the problems that educators are observing in their classroom, the, edu the problems that educators are, you know, um, have identified within their professional practice. And I wonder whether, Wei Ping, in your interaction um, with teachers and educators, whether there, are, there have been some salient problems that have been identified and which you think will be able to drive or advance the you know science of learning field forward yeah yep. again very good question and i think one of the biggest problems that or at least for me personally i face is the is that we speak different languages um as a neuroscientist obviously we tend to speak very differently um, educators speak very differently as well. And I think it is trying to, or at least if we can understand understand each other um, in a way that uh, uh, we can all get down and uh, try to have a, a conversation with one another without having to go, oh, what is this and what is that? What does the prefrontal cortex do? What does the TPJ do? Right. So I, I think that 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 to me presents uh, the, the, the one of the first few obstacles, which I think uh, uh, even for me as, as a neuroscientist, when I, when I look at some of the, uh, the, the, the learning theories, I go, I do not understand this myself, right? So it's not that they don't understand me, I don't understand them as well, right? So it is, it is really my own naivety that has, that has also maybe caused some sort of, hmm, if I don't understand something, maybe I maybe I shouldn't be engaging in it, right? But I, I think the whole idea for this science of learning is that both groups of people or multiple groups of people get together and they understand one another. I think that 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 to me, speaking a common language amongst teachers and and students or teachers and 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 researchers um, will help to get rid of some of the obstacles that 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 we do face. So I think that that pr probably to me is is the 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 biggest uh, um, take home that that I've got. Thanks, Wei Ping. Um, I, and I think uh, one area that we probably, um, it's been alluded to by the various speakers, but I think we probably didn't delve deep enough and it might potentially be, you know, the next um, Imagining Educational Future Seminar for Dennis, but really about the role of machines in, you know, moving in parallel with us into advancing the science of learning field, because um, as uh, John alluded to earlier, we want to be thinking about interventions for all. Uh, Gigi talked about how we want to be nuanced the, 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 the kinds of interventions that we are going to be implementing for, say, linguistic diverse learners. And um, Weeping has highlighted about, you know, the, how neuroimaging modalities might give us a deeper insight into some of the variable um, individual differences when it comes to learning in the classroom or maybe even in terms of, you know, physiological um, physiology or exercise sports. But the role of machines potentially, you know, could afford us um, some kind of data analysis, analytics, and maybe, maybe even, you know, harnessing the power of artificial intelligence to move us towards when we talk about teacher triage, we talk about personalized learning, personalized interventions, personalized instructions, and how machines can potentially, you know, catalyze us forward within this area. And I wonder whether, you know, panel, um, the panel speakers, whether you might have any um, further insights into how we can harness the power of science of learning working together, um, you know, with technology, with machines to kind of like advance the field forward. Anyone? <laughs> I, I can jump in here. So you mentioned a couple of levels of uh, units of analysis. So we start from big data, uh, like MOOC, we get like tens of thousands of data. And, but traditional education research also have a lot of uh, really nice quality, um, um, qualitative study that actually put faces to those numbers. And I think we cannot miss out on that part because Numbers are numbers, but it's also important to pay, put faces on these numbers so we understand what they really mean. And neuroscience kind of come in between, and, and not only neuroscience, and the, the psychological approach using samples comes in between. And I think uh, what you mentioned, it's a really great way of framing how we're going to propel and move it forward, such as AI, how do we use machine learning to facilitate um, 
teachers' um, management of uh, student learnings. For example, we know from research that uh, paced out learning is more effective than having a big exam, for example. And so in that case, then um, I think machine learning and AI could help us to figure out what are the chunks of knowledge that can be uh, delivered to students from teachers and also get um, feedback on a, a more regular and automatic basis. Um, I'm not saying that we should not have the traditional teaching, but I think these little things can facilitate teaching so that we, even if we have limited human capital, we can still give high quality and monitoring progress of learning in students. That's right. And I think, John, you've also experienced this in your research where you had, you know, you were able to identify the percentage of teacher talk within the classroom. And it's really through your, the data and the analytics that you have harnessed um, in informing you some of the, the pedagogies that are being enacted in the classroom. So um, given that we actually do not have much time on this panel discussion, um, I wonder whether uh, the other panel speakers might have anything else to add with regards to, you know, the rich discussions that we have had here. Anything from John? Well, I've spent the last six years in the Science of Learning Centre and going to Wee Ping's argument, I have forced myself and I've enjoyed learning the language and the data and the methodologies of my uh, colleagues that are in completely different disciplines. And I think that's the major benefit of what we're doing here is seeing the world through different perspectives. Like you talk about data in schools. Schools are awash with data now. The last thing they want is more data. They want more interpretation. They want to see the world of their, their classrooms through different lenses and different eyes. And so maximising that interpretation, and that's why I'm a great fan of what you're trying to do in Singapore at the moment is to bring multiple perspectives, multiple methodologies, multiple ideas, multiple interpretations from, as Gigi points out, from, from the kids in the classrooms right through to the neuroscience. And whilst it will be not an easy, it will be the right challenge. <sighs> Indeed, it will be the right challenge for us to propel our Science of Learning and Education Centre forward. Weeping, any um, last words from you? <laughs> um, well, I, I, I think um, I, I do echo what uh, Gigi and John has mentioned earlier on. I think there needs to be more conversations between uh, the different stakeholders, especially here within Singapore. I think that's what we are trying to build here at the Science of Learning and Education Centre. Um, and of course, also to leverage on our international connections as well. Like, I mean, we modeled our science of learning center with the slrc um, so it's, it will be very interesting and fascinating to sort of see how some of your processes work um, maybe still some ideas um, um, and you know uh, and then have some sort of uh, 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 i guess uh, uh, collaboration um, that would leverage on both our systems um, that would benefit um, the, the learners and students and teachers and even researchers ourselves at the end of the day Thank you, Wei Ping. So I think this would kind of like conclude, you know, what Denise earlier alluded to, the science, art and technology of learning. We do have findings from the science of learning, but we do need the art from teachers' pedagogical repertoire to design the right kind of interventions for all. And of course, working with the technology of learning with regards to, you know, machines, data and anal analytics. Thank you to all the speakers and all presenters. And over to you, Denise. Thank you, Azi. Um, I, I do have to apologize to a lot of our participants. There's a lot of questions coming uh, that, that came in and we don't have time to answer all of them. Uh, however, I do hope that you have found uh, the talk quite enlightening and insightful. Uh, please bear with us just for a moment longer. We have a QR code that's up on the screen that leads to a feedback form. Your feedback is important to us and will help us to organize future Imagining Educational Futures uh, webinar. So please do spare a minute um, or two to fill up the form. Um, for myself, I think if there's one thing um, I've learned about the science of learning is, is really to rebalance a common educational problem, a point that I think John alluded to earlier on, and it is this tendency to emphasize what teachers do to ensure the acquisition of subject matter by students. Uh, that we lose sight of how and why different students learn. I think John, John Dewey in his uh, book, Democracy and Education, hits right at the heart of the aim of science of learning with this question, how shall the individual be rendered executive in his intelligence instead of at the cost of his intelligence? 
I believe science of learning has the potential to allow us to rediscover the student and the learner and to extend Dewey's ideas from more than 100 years ago, with, which is to reimagine the student as an engaged, purposive, intentional agent in his or her learning, and hence worthy of the deepest and the most profound consideration in the processes of education. So thank you again, and this has been a fantastic session for everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good night, wherever in the world you may be. Thank you. Mm -hmm.